Well, we're in uh, part two of this uh, these collection of talks that we're simply calling the battlefield of the mind. I've, I've loved every second of it so far. I, I kind of wish I had more time every week. Uh, we're, we're always sort of backing up against time restraints because we got two gatherings. But I wish I had like unlimited time because I would just preach all four of these messages every week. Just like back to back to back to back to back. Like mostly because there's just so much to say and we are so slow on the uptake. But I don't have the liberty to do that. But what I, what I do want to do is sort of catch you up from where we were last weekend. Because what, what we said is that you and I are in a war for our life. But it is not a war of flesh and blood. But in, and yet, in the same way, in like a natural war where, where we might be fighting with guns and missiles and tanks, if the enemy takes the capital city, generally it takes the nation. And, and so make no mistake, the enemy is intent on getting your capital city, like the most coveted place of spiritual geography, which is your mind. Because what we said is if, if, if he gets your mind, if he gets your thinking, your thought life, then he gets your entire life. So it, it shouldn't surprise us when the Apostle Paul reminds us in, in Romans 12 too, and again, if you're memorizing scripture, this is one you're going to want to just hold on to. It needs to be like right at the, the front banner of your mind. It says, therefore, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the, the point is that the battle for our life, it begins and ends right here in, in our mind, in our thought life. And so where, where we finished last weekend is we landed in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I, I wanted to do a quick review of, of where we were, and then uh, I'll show you where we're going to go today. L listen to what the Apostle Paul says. This is, again, if you weren't here last weekend, I would encourage you to go listen to it or watch it. Here's what he says. For though we live in the world, this is the world we're living in, no getting out of this. Though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So I don't know if you know, this is all war language. Right, you got weapons and fighting and strongholds and captives. I mean, there's like prisoners of war. I mean, it sounds more like a, an excerpt from the Geneva Convention than, than the Bible, right? And so what, what we did last weekend in, in this text is we, we just asked and answered a single question. I don't know if we fully answered it, but we, we asked a single question. The question is, how do you take a thought captive? How, how do you, how do you uh, rule over your thought life? How do we take every thought that's in here, whether it's from us or from the enemy, or like how, how do we take every thought that's up here and we subdue it? How do we make it obedient to Christ? And, and it, was, it was beautiful. I think it was, it was helpful. Uh, but what, what I'd like to do, and what, what we said if you weren't here, is we essentially said the enemy's coming in all the time and he's just planting lies. He's planting deceptions in, in our life so that we'll shipwreck our life, so that we'll go off the rails, do our own thing, depend on our own strength. And be, because if you know Jesus, the very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. So you have power over your mind. So you can take those lies and then you can replace those lies with what God says about himself, what he says about you, what he says about the world, what he says about people around you. And, and in doing that, we can take those thoughts that he plants and we can just send them back in right back to the to the, the pit of hell where they belong. And that, again, last week was beautiful. I think it was helpful for some of us. But in, in reading it again and again, I realized, like, we, we left a lot of meat on the bone. Do you guys know that phrase? Like, we, we left, so what I want to do, I want to actually go back over this text one more time, and we're, we're going to ask and answer a different question today. So let's, let's go ahead and read this one more time. He says this. He says for though we live in this world, so just, just think, think through this with your spiritual eyes, with your spiritual mind. We live in this world. We do not wage war as the world does. Meaning, we, we, okay, we are in a battle. Make no mistake. I mean, I know it feels like we're in peacetime in the U.S., but like we're in a battle, but it's not a seen battle. It's an unseen battle, and our weapons are not weapons of guns or bullets, or tasers, or tanks, or missiles. Like, those are not our weapons. Paul says, no. The weapons we fight with, believers, what we fight with, are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, th these spiritual weapons 
have divine power to demolish strongholds. Okay, so you gotta ask a question. What's a stronghold? By definition, a stronghold is a defensive position that, that's basically impenetrable. Okay, so any Lord of the Rings fans? Thank God. Okay, yeah, just think Helm's Deep, right? Helm's Deep. It's, it, it, uh, uh, a stronghold, by, in the positive definition, is a, a, a defensive position that a smaller, weaker army can, can defend, but basically indefinitely against a much stronger, more powerful army. Now, that's the positive definition of stronghold. Generally, in the Bible, when, when it speaks of strongholds, it speaks about it in a negative sense, though. And, and what I mean is this. What, what I want you to do, just for a moment, I want you to just, just look at the landscape of, of your life right now. And I want you to ask the question, where has the enemy built strongholds in your life? Where, where, is he have, where does he have a defensive position that you're like, I, there's just no getting around it. Like, I, he's just going to, he, he's there. And you might ask the question, well, how do, how do I know what a defensive position, how do I know what a stronghold looks like in my life? And it's actually a really easy answer. You just look where the enemy has planted a flag in your life. Meaning, where is it so clear that the enemy is winning and you're losing? So, for example, like, just look at your life right now, just honestly, with clear eyes. Where, what are parts of your life right now where, where addiction is thriving? Where, like, you're doom scrolling for, like, four hours at a time. Where, like, sugar is ruling you. Where chocolate cake, where alcohol. Just look at the places where addiction, like, being ruled by something else is, is, is thriving. Look at the places in, in your life where like you're, you're believing some lies about yourself, you're believing lies about other people, you're believing lies about the world, you're believing lies about uh, your own value, your mission. Like look at the places where, where lies are taking root. Look at the places in your life where little acts of rebellion, and I know like we're, we're Americans and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm an American, but here's what we say. We're like, I'm an American. You can't tell me what to do. But we do that all the time. It's like a one-way street. It's like, you can't tell me. I'm going down this one-way street. You can't tell me. Like, look at the little places of rebellion in your life that have become normative for you. That's a stronghold. And, and so here, here's the amazing news. These, these places that, that very clearly you're losing and he's winning, the beauty is if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've trusted in the work of Jesus, you have the power of heaven to tear down every one of those strongholds and to live free from all of those. So he says, we have divine power to tear down strongholds, and we have divine power to demolish arguments. I wish I would have preached this during the election. Like, we're, we're not an arguing people. Some of you think it's a virtue to win an argument. It's a virtue just to keep your mouth shut. You know what? Our, our, the war is not this world. Some of you are like, I'm going to another church. Okay. <laughs> we, we demolish arguments. Every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It's every lie. And we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. Okay, so the question that, that I want to ask, I want to do my best to answer in 20 minutes. I want to ask and answer this question. If the weapons we fight with are not of the world, of this world, what are the weapons we fight with? Prayer. And my mind immediately goes, and some of you it goes to, uh, it would be Ephesians 6, where, where Paul's like, finally, brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord. So just a reminder on the front end, he's like, you don't have any strength. Your goal is not to tap into strength. You're weak. And you're, you're, whatever little strength you do have as a human is not going to move the needle. He's like, so finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. And after you've done everything to stand, stand. Stand firm with the belt of truth. 
with the feet, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. So if you're wondering, what are the weapons we fight with? Those are the weapons we fight with. This isn't like a VBS illustration. These are the weapons for war. Now, if you were going to ask me, John, what is the summary of, of Ephesians 6? I, I would say the summary is this. is Every person born on planet Earth, that's you and me, every person born on planet Earth is born behind enemy lines. And when, when you and I get saved, when, when, we, when we meet Jesus, like for real, we are recipients of a like a most epic rescue mission ever. And then when we get rescued, then we get on a rescue team. And when we get on the rescue team, immediately he gives us weapons for the war. So nothing more sad, nothing more discouraging as a pastor, honestly, than seeing Christians that are just like not in the fight, not invested, not risking, like just staying at home. It's like, man, you were rescued at great cost. And so Paul, he's like, okay, I, I, I mean, my, my favor is probably the shield of faith. In part, because Paul's like, he, in my mind, as, as he's writing this, he's got to be looking over at some Roman soldiers. Because that was like in that time. And in the Roman soldiers, they carried this, this shield. It was like four feet tall. I'm like really short, okay? It's like four feet tall. <laughs> Uh, and, and you know what they do? Before they go into battle, they would soak the shield in water. You know why? Because to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the enemy. And what's so cool is then the, these, these shields, they were crafted in such a way to fit together. So if you went to battle, then every other Roman soldier had the same shield, and you could make a front line of 50 soldiers, and it was a solid wall. But here's what's so epic and just disturbing and genius all at the same time. When, when Rome would conquer a city, the first thing that they would do is they would cons conscript all the boys and the, and the men in the city. to they, they were now part of the Roman army, right? And so what was so kind of wicked and genius about that is instead of, because uh, like, what they would do is, is with all the families, they would separate them and send, send them to different colonies in the Roman Empire, right, to... to so that, that way they were just like, there's part of Rome now. But what they would do with all the men is they would actually keep them together in war. And so what would happen is you're, you're on the front line now, conscripted by, by, by Rome, and you're looking down the line, and there's your dad. And there are your uncles. And there are your brothers down the line. And there are your sons down the line. And so technically, when, when they would ship you out into a city to conquer that city, yeah, I mean, technically, you're fighting for Rome, but you're looking down the, ro the row, and you're like, I'm not actually fighting for Rome. I'm fighting for them. Like, we're going to make it out of here. And that's the, that's the beautiful picture of, of, like, the gospel community. He's like, I I've given you the shield I've given you these weapons, and, and you're fighting for each other. And it's just, it's the invitation and the warning. If you're, if you're trying to do the Christian life by yourself, you're not going to make it. You're not. And so he's like, I've given you the shield of faith. And then he's like, and then you got the helmet of salvation. And we gave a nod to, to this helmet last week because what we said is that you and I have got to have a deep knowledge of the love of God. Because the, the war is, is hard. The war, it gets dark. And, and in, in the fight, when you find yourself in the fight, you're going to realize I'm weak and I'm frail and I'm inconsistent and I'm not as sly and, and I'm not the fighter that I thought I was. And all of a sudden you realize halfway through the fight, the victory is not coming at my hands. And what you realize in the middle of that is that your heavenly father, my heavenly father, shed the blood of his son so that we might get victory. When Jesus walked out of the tomb alive, he's the one declaring victory once and for all for us. And so it gives us a kind of confidence to be in the fight, that the fight and the victory of the fight is not dependent on us, but he wants us in the fight nonetheless. And then he gives us the sword of the spirit, which he says is the word of God. 
And we definitely gave a nod to that last weekend because we said the enemy who is very real, the enemy of our soul who, who longs to kill you and steal from you and destroy your life. He's not just a, a cartoon character with a pitchfork. He's a dragon that wants to kill you and eat you and send your children to hell. And so when the enemy comes in and he, he puts a lie, a deception in our minds, we've been given this weapon of the sword of the spirit to dislodge the lies and then to fill our minds with the, the truth. That we renew our mind with the truth of who God says he is about himself, the truth that he says about us, the truth about the world, the truth of the mission, the courage, the faith that he's given all of us in, in Christ. And so we, we renew our minds by, by the sword of the spirit. And listen, this is, one, this is the primary reason. We're, we're like regularly, and I know some of you feel like beat up about this, and it's just, maybe, maybe I do beat, beat up on it. I, I, the, Every, every time we're gathered, I'm just going to be like, we've got to be Bible people, guys. Like, we, we have to memorize Scripture. We have to hold the promises of God over our life, not just like on Sundays or, you know, on Mother's Day or on Easter. Like, we've we got to hold the promises of God over our lives like every hour. Because, listen, you... Whatever you think on is what you're going to become. Whatever you think on is what you're going to, you, you think about money all the time, you're going to be greedy. You think about sex all the time, I mean, you're just going to be like some pervert. Seriously. But you think on the things of God, you become like Jesus. I mean, Augustine talked about this as it relates to the thought life. He's like, our words, which flow from our, our thoughts, he's like, our words create worlds. So if you want a, a, a life, a world that flows out of the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit and the beauty of, of God, like it begins here. Rooting our, our minds, our hearts, our lives in Scripture. So what, what I'd like to do, uh, just for the next few minutes, and, and by the way, the last part of this, the last weapon we see is prayer. Clearly, is prayer. So what I want to do is I want to briefly spend a few minutes on, uh, on two of these weapons. The first weapon we're going to look at is a sword, the sword of the Spirit. And then we're going to also briefly look at the weapon of prayer. And I don't think, I don't think this is going to be new information for anybody, maybe for a few of you. But uh, mostly my hope is that this is going to move us as a house. It's going to move us to get out of the defensive position and it's going to get us in the fight. So let's begin with, with the sword, okay? So uh, somebody got a, a paper Bible? You got a paper Bible. Just hold that thing up for everybody. Hold that. I love it. Look how thick that mug is. I love it. Okay, listen. That, that thing right there, that's a, that's a sword. He says that's the sword. Okay, but before it's a sword, listen, it's the covenant of God towards us. And because it's the covenant, meaning this is, this is God's like, I'm making promises to you. Not contingent on you fulfilling promises to me. I'm making a covenant with you. And what that should stir up is love. I mean, God has so loved me, and so I, I am going to love the word. I'm going to love the word. But listen, I can't make you love the word. We got to love the word, though. Before you, you hold the, the, the sword, of this, before you use it as an offensive weapon, you have to love it. Because if you don't love the word and you only use it as a weapon, all you're going to be hurting are people because you're going to be trying to win arguments. You're going to use it as like, well, you believe this. Well, I believe. It's like you're using this as well. It's like, listen, the sword is designed only for one. It's for the devil. It's the sword of the spirit. And so first we have to learn to love the word, like fall, like, like the same way that a, a thirsty person coming out of the desert would, would just put his whole head in a well and drink deeply. A starving person going to a, a banquet and just like, just eating. And like, this is how we come to the word. Like, we love it. I'm, it satisfies me to the deepest places. But listen, I can't make you love it. I, listen, I can't make you love things. I've tried for 20 years. Like, you should stop watching Alabama football, and you should watch professional tennis with me. 
And you're like, you're an idiot. Like, I can't get you to love tennis. And I can't get you to love the Bible. I can't. I can't get you to love scripture. But you have to. If you don't love scripture, you're, you won't make it. Like it's the revelation of, of God to us. You're not going to make it. And listen, I, I know. I, 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 let me say in this front. I know that the Bible is hard. If you're a new Christian, I know the Bible is hard to understand sometimes, especially for the first time. I get that. I, I know that you're like, um, I just, I, I'm not good at memorizing things, and I don't memorize things, and I'm just not, it's just not, it's like, I'm just, and I, listen, I'm just going to because out of love, I love you. That's just the stupidest answer I've ever heard in my life. I don't memorize things. I'm not good at memorizing. It's like, yes, you are. Every person in my generation has the first verse of Ice Ice Baby memorized. So listen, you'll memorize whatever you want to memorize. Anybody want to do it right now? I just, I, listen, I'm out of time. I'm not going to do that, okay? No. I'll do that in the second gathering. Listen now, Jesus, he, 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 he's serious about the word. Jesus says this in John 8. He says, to the Jews who had believed him. So these are, these are disciples. To the Jews who believed him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are really my disciples. Isn't it interesting how he used that little adverb? He's like, I mean, he's not, like, I'm your disciple. He's like, but if, you, if you're really going to be my disciple, then, like, you, you abide in my word. He says, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So he's like, if you'll abide in my word, and abide is, is a, it's another word for communion. He's like, if you'll just be with me, and I don't mean like, you know, the two-minute devotional on Tuesdays, and again, I know we all start somewhere and start with that, that's fine, but, but it dispels us, like, no, I want to abide with him. I'm abiding in his word. I'm thinking about his word. I'm, I'm letting it wash over me every hour. Every time I'm, I'm in the car, every time I'm about to step into a meeting, every time I'm in a conversation, I'm, I'm abiding with him. And listen, we don't abide with him because he's going to make everything okay or everything better. We abide with him because he is better than everything. But like sadly, the, the vast majority, I don't know, there's two, two, 250 people in here, over 50% of you, just, just based on a new poll from, from Barna, over 50% of you, you only open your Bible on Sundays. And like, no condemnation. Just, that's just like reality. And I don't know, you'll come in and be like, well, John, it's your job to feed me. And it is. That's part of my role. And I, listen, I'm doing the work. I'm a chef, buddy. I am. I'm doing the work for you, and, and some might call it a feast, okay? I, I, I didn't say that. Okay? I'm not saying it's a five-star. That's probably more like City Cafe. But listen, you, you're going to get satisfied. You're going to be like, that was a meal. But listen, friends, if you only eat once a week, you're not going to make it. You're going to be weak and emaciated, and you're easy pickings. For the enemy. No wonder you're believing every lie. And again, I know some of you are like, your, this little thing rises up, you're like, you can't tell me what to do. You're trying to guilt me. I'm not trying to guilt you. Listen, if you, if you want to come in here and only like, you know, you only eat once a week, you can do that, but just know, just know, in the spirit, you're a spiritual baby. It's like showing up once a month to church with your spiritual onesie on. You got like dried milk on the you know, corner of your mouth. Wah! Wah! And listen, I... <laughs> I love babies, not, not real babies. I love spiritual babies, okay? I, you know, so like, listen... You, you're easy to spot, by the way. 
I'm being serious. So I love you, but I love you enough to say, it's time to get a fork and a knife out. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Like, is it like I'm getting commentaries out and, and I'm, you know, reading and it's like, listen, you, there's a thousand ways to, to abide in the word. I mean, like, get a playlist of sermons. Just like, I'm just listening to sermons in the car. Like, start listening to the Bible. Listen to different translations. Start reading Christian books. Like, there's a lot, and memorize scripture. There's a thousand ways to eat. But go back to, to John 8, just, just quickly, because I, I want to be very clear. The point of the Bible is not the Bible. The point of being a Bible person is not so we can be like, we're Bible people. I mean, some of the most arrogant people I know are Bible people. Because, you know, the Bible teaches us knowledge puffs up. So this isn't about getting more knowledge, though you will get more knowledge. The point of the Bible is to, to give us revelation of Jesus. The point of the Bible is to get us in deeper relationship with the Father. The point of the Bible is to, to, to soften up our, sh- our, soft, our sharp edges. The point of the Bible is to correct us where we're arrogant. The point of the Bible is to build us up where we're discouraged. It's to get us in deep communion with God. And this is what Jesus said in John 8. He's like, uh, he's talking to these guys who were Jews who were disciples. And, and these Jews, they literally had memorized, at that time, the, they had memorized what, you know, the, their Bible, which was Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The majority of the Jews, they knew Torah, memorized it. And we're like, I don't know, I got like one verse. They memorized the Bible. And yet Jesus is like, I'm not impressed by that. I'm not impressed with how much you know. And the reason he's like, you know the word, but the living word is standing right in front of you. And so again, the point of of scripture is not to be like, I read the Bible. It's like, no, the point of the Bible is to get us to the Father. Make our hearts tender to his calling over our life. Let let me say it this way and then quickly, moving on. Do you remember when you were a kid? And uh, I remember when I was in, in a playground, when I was growing up, and the trump card on the playground at that time was always like, my dad will beat up your dad. Now, it was a lie for me because, like, my dad was an academic and an attorney and a stockbroker and never changed a tire in his life and, you know, washed his hands 49 times a day. Like, he was that. I love my dad. I really, I, you know, he's amazing. But, um, <laughs> but that's what you do. Like, you get picked on and you're like, my dad's going to beat up your dad. Or my dad's going to beat you up. And, and they're like, well, my dad's going to beat your dad up, right? And, and my, my point is simply this. There is a confidence as a child that you have a father that's going to take care of you. And the point of being in scripture, the point of like submerging ourselves in who God is, is it gives us confidence. We're not in the fight on our own. And actually, the victory is not even dependent on us. We have a father that's, that's secured the victory on our account. And yet he, like a, like a father to a child, he just invites us in. Not, not because he's depending on us to win, because he wants us to participate. We're co-heirs in the kingdom with him. So look what he says. We're going to finish quickly. Ephesians 6, verse 18. Now talking about prayer. He says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And I don't have time to talk about this. But you can talk about praying in the Spirit can mean lots of things. It could mean praying in tongues. It could mean uh, Romans 8 where you don't know what to pray and, and you're just groaning. If you've ever been in, in just like the worst moment of your life and you're just crying and moaning and groaning. And he says that is the Spirit of God praying through you. It, it could be um, you're, you're in times of solitude and quiet and, and the spirit of God just, just fills your mind with what to pray. Like there's lots of ways to what it means to be praying in the spirit. But he's like, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. So he's like, just notice, you see, you see all the times of prayer, he's like, pray, pray at all times, all kinds of prayer, pray for me, pray with and pray for the Lord's people. So let me ask you the question, who is praying for you? And don't be like, well, my mama prays for me. It's like, you lie to your mama. She doesn't know. Like, who, who's in it with you? 
Who's, who's the one, who's the people that know, that know it all? They're like, they're in, they're in, they're in the, the foxhole with you. I mean, Jesus, en route to the cross, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he calls his, his, his three. He says, Peter, James, and John, come with me, come with me. Watch him pray with me, watch him pray. I, I've got a task ahead of me, and the entire world depends on this. Watch and pray. Watch and pray with me. Watch. I'm not going to make it by myself. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. I mean, this is Jesus, by the way, calling his brothers. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, who was like, if I don't have brothers praying for me, I might not finish the task. Like, how much, how much more do you think we, we need each other? Again, if you're, if you're going at this by yourself, you're, you're just not going to but you can put that on your mind. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna cross the finish line because I've got people walking with me. And, and then one more verse. David, I love this so much. He says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Now, we have so jacked up this hymn I mean, you used to because of the Baptist bookstore, they're not around anymore, but you know, you'd walk into the Baptist bookstore, there'd be this big, you know, velvet painting of a deer by a stream. It's like, it's like, is that, this is terrible. Or, or, and I, listen, I love hymns, but like, this hymn is terrible. We have ruined this psalm with, with the song. You got, as the deer panteth for the water so much. It's like, ah, oh, listen, I, this is David. Okay, I'm not a hunter, but I know a lot of hunters, are, like, if you're a hunter, you'll get this. If you've been deer hunting, you know this. A, a chilled deer is not a panting deer. A chased deer is a panting deer. Right, And so the, the deer is like running from the hunter and then just ev evades the hunter just for a moment and then he finds a stream and he, he drinks knowing if I can just get some water, like I'll survive the day. And David's like, I, I, I've been running from enemies my whole life. I'm running all over the world. But if I can just get a drink from God, if I can just get a drink from his spirit, if I can just get a drink from his abiding word, I'll make it another day. So listen, that's prayer, by the way. Pr don't, don't, don't buy into this Sunday school garbage. Like pray prayer's talking to God. Like it is. But it's way more than that. It's, we're not gonna make it without prayer. Like what was fundamental in the early church that gave the church power? And signs and wonders and move the church to transform entire cities has now become supplemental to us. So like, no wonder we're losing. And I don't mean like, please don't be like, yeah, we're losing America. It's like, no, no, no. I'm talking about losing ground in our own life. And yet, you don't have to. You don't have to. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, if you're a Jesus person. He's giving you the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and prayer to defeat the plans, the lies, the deceptions of the enemy.